the 2006 Billy Corbin directed documentary, Cocaine Cowboys, the world will be introduced to a man by the name of John Purnell Roberts, a Vietnam veteran, a notorious cocaine trafficker who moved to Miami in the 1970s and ultimately became affiliated with the Medellin cartel. By the mid-1970s, John Roberts claimed to be moving 50 kilos of coke a month at a value of a half a million dollars. He would also befriend Meyer Lansky after meeting him at the Forge restaurant during his time in Miami. In 1977, Meyer Lansky's stepson, Richard Schwartz, was arrested for the murder of Craig Chariaka, which took place at the Forge restaurant. Later that year, on October 12, 1977, Schwartz would be shot dead in the parking lot of his Bay Harbor Island restaurant. John Purnell Roberts would claim that he was a part of the assassination and the fatal gunshot blast would be delivered by Enrique Ricky Prado, a man who was said to be a hired assassin turned CIA operative. In 1978, John Purnell Roberts would meet Fabito Ochoa, son of Don Fabio Ochoa Restrepo. Fabito, along with his brothers Jorge and Juan, would be major players in the cartel. Fabito was in Miami, looking to grow his family's organization and make alliances with the reliable traffickers, John Roberts becoming one of them. John Roberts would first help Fabito Ochoa in smuggling cocaine from the Bahamas into a harbor in North Bay Village located in Miami. John would tell Fabito, who was having trouble shipping cocaine into Miami, that he had the cops of North Bay Village on his payroll. And soon, a massive load of coke was being shipped into Biscayne Bay and loaded into the North Bay Village. All the while, police, who were in on the scheme, turned a blind eye. John Roberts would also be a major player in cargo plane shipments of cocaine, which were flown out of Colombia and into the United States. He would set up secret airfields and use listening devices to eavesdrop on the Coast Guard. They would impart all types of technology in their efforts to thwart the wrath of the United States government. John would learn a lot about the United States airstrips, which were not heavily monitored by the government, and various smuggling techniques using airplanes, after meeting infamous cocaine smuggler and CIA operative Barry Seal in 1980. Seal at that time had just formed an alliance with the Medellin cartel, and John Roberts was the man to make sure everything went smooth with Barry's initial involvement. During John Roberts' prolific career as a cocaine trafficker for the Medellin cartel, he would work with the likes of the Ochoa brothers, Rafael Cardona, and of course, Pablo Escobar. After being arrested in 1986, Roberts, who obtained the nickname the Bearded Gringo by law enforcement, would become state's witness and shine light on his exploits working for the cartel. He claimed to have helped import numerous tons of cocaine into the United States, worth billions of dollars. He would serve only three years due to his cooperation with the government. But who was John Purnell Roberts before all this cartel business? Where exactly did he come from? Who was his family? John Purnell Roberts was born John Riccobono to Nat and Edie Riccobono in the Bronx, New York City in 1948. Moving forward, we'll refer to him as John Riccobono. John would grow up on White Plains Road in the Bronx in an apartment above Luna Italian Restaurant located at 3531 White Plains Road. This is what the place would have looked like in the 1940s. Luna Restaurant would go on to be filmed for the legendary 1972 Godfather scene where Michael Corleone, Wax Virgil Solozzo, and Captain Mark McCluskey. In the film, the restaurant is known as Louis Restaurant. John Riccobono would be born into a family rich in organized crime history. His father Nat and uncle Sam and Joseph came to the United States from Palermo, Sicily in the 1920s and would all go on to be involved in mob activities. According to Riccobono, his father Nat controlled bars in New Jersey and was big in the numbers game. In the book American Desperado, co-authored by Evan Wright and John Purnell Roberts, a.k.a. John Riccobono, Riccobono would go on to claim that when he was seven years old, his father executed a man on a bridge, all the while John was in his father's car, witnessing the whole event. Perhaps the most notorious of John's family would be his uncle Joseph Riccobono. Joseph Riccobono, also known as Staten Island Joe, was a Gambino crime family bigwig who was once aligned with Murder, Inc. during the 1930s. In January of 1945, 
Joseph Riccobono would plead guilty for his role in a conspiracy that extorted $1 million a year from New York City's Garment District. The following year, he would be given a suspended sentence and placed on three years probation. Newspapers at the time would refer to him as the last member of the Lepke Gura Murder Inc. gang to be taken into custody. On October 25, 1957, Riccobono's then boss, Albert Anastasia, was executed at the Park Central Hotel in Manhattan. Two days later, mob informant Alfredo Sant'Antonio would tell authorities that Anastasia's murder was orchestrated by Joseph Riccobono, Joseph Biondo, and Charles Dongara. According to Sant'Antonio, he had received a tip from Capo Joseph Franco that Anastasia was targeting Riccobono, Dongara, and Biondo, and they were marked for death. Later that year, on November 14, 1957, Joseph Riccobono would be arrested at the famed Appalachian Summit, which took place on the property of Pennsylvania crime family boss Joe Barbera in Teoka County, upstate New York. The meeting brought in a slew of mafia powerhouses at that time, who would come together to discuss the inner workings of the mafia and future plans for organizations throughout the United States. However, the summit would be raided by law enforcement, after state police became suspicious of all the fancy cars and characters entering the property where the summit was taking place. This would result in over 60 arrests, some of them including the arrest of Vito Genovese, PA bosses Joe Barbera and Russell Buffalino, Philly boss Joe Ida, Florida boss Santo Traficante, Carlo Gambino, and pictured here, Paul Castellano, Carmine and the Dr. Lombardozzi, and Joseph Riccobono sitting closest to the window. According to John Riccobono, he would state in his book American Desperado that his father Nat Riccobono would also attend the meeting, which would result in his deportation back to Italy in 1959, because unlike his brothers, he was not a United States citizen. However, I could not find further evidence to corroborate this. Joseph Riccobono would go on to serve as Carlo Gambino's consigliere in the Gambino crime family. In 1975, he would pass away in Staten Island at the age of 81. He would be remembered most as a quiet and trusted confidant of Carlo Gambino and powerful racketeer in New York's garment industry. Now let's get into some other connections that John Riccobono had during his time in New York City before beginning his career as a notorious Miami drug trafficker. It's important to know that John Riccobono's criminal career began years before getting involved in the Miami cocaine trade. He would be on law enforcement's radar more than a few times. Around 1969, Riccobono would get involved in the nightclub business with the help of a man named Andy Benfante, who Riccobono described as a young Carlo Gambino protege. According to John Riccobono, he was given free reign to muscle in on the nightclub and restaurant scene, one being the Salvation Disco in Greenwich Village, Manhattan, owned by a man named Bobby Wood. On February 18th, 1970, Bobby Wood would be found shot dead on a Queen Street. According to John Riccobono, he was told to take care of Bobby Wood because he had become drug-addled and reckless. However, he would have no comment in regard to his connection to the death of Bobby Wood, but he would be questioned after Bobby Wood left a letter to his lawyer warning him about his relationship with John Riccobono. Another incident was the kidnapping of Jimi Hendrix from the Salvation Club. According to Rick Abono, he became friendly with Hendrix, and Hendrix would come by his home sometimes. Hendrix would be abducted by some young Italians and brought to a house and kept captive for a couple of days. Rick Abono claimed to save Hendrix from the situation and hand the abductors a severe beating. This would put John on the FBI's radar after he was questioned about the event. John Rick Abono would be involved in numerous criminal activities, including armed robbery, credit card schemes, and fake diamond schemes. In the book American Desperado, he would speak openly about his 1970s New York City criminal lifestyle, saying, quote, I like doing evil things, and I like putting a gun in people's faces. I like to see the surprise in their face. Furthermore, he would compare robbery to sex, like an orgasm for your brain. He would even get in trouble ripping off wise guys during his time in New York City, and had to answer to his uncle, Gambino Consiglieri Joseph Riccobono, more than once. Another criminal in the John Riccobono ether was a man by the name of Peter Corso. 
who was the father of John Riccobono's common-law wife, Phyllis Latore Corso, who he would be with for 10 years. Peter Corso was a notorious heroin trafficker with numerous arrests throughout his career, including a robbery in 1938, for which he would be sentenced to 15 years for. He would not serve the full 15, but in 1952, he would be arrested again, this time for heroin possession. In 1971, he would be sentenced to five years for intent to distribute heroin. In 1981, he would serve two years once again for heroin charges. Peter Corso would be arrested in 1984 for the murder of lawyer Archimedes Cervera, whom owed money to what was described as a disgruntled former client. He would be acquitted of that murder, but here's where Peter Corso's story gets a little more interesting. Peter Corso was said to be involved with numerous people tied to organized crime. When he was arrested in 1984, law enforcement claimed that his case tied into the indictment of 21 members and associates of the Gambino crime family, including Paul Castellano, in relation to Roy DeMeo's murderous activity and notorious auto theft ring. Of the over 20 murders that were listed as a part of the indictment, the murder of Archimedes Cervera was not one of them, which leaves us wondering why his activity was somehow tied into the indictment. Now let's look at some interesting facts. For one, the police said that he had purchased guns and silencers from someone in the Gambino murder for hire crew, meaning the DeMeo crew. One name that comes to my mind is Edward Fast Eddie Rendini, a DeMeo crew associate who supplied them with numerous guns and silencers and was also part of the 1984 indictment. Could that be a connection? Possibly. Also, for those who have studied the DeMeo crew, you may have seen a couple of lists floating around over the past few years. It lists the murders by the crew, locations, those involved, and even some events surrounding the murders. Much of these details are not named in the 1992 book Murder Machine, which profiled the DeMeo crew, or the FBI files. This, to me, was no doubt leaked by someone in law enforcement or someone connected to law enforcement. Here, you see a murder which occurred on either 76 or 77, which involves someone who stole from a Roy DeMeo stash house. On the bottom, you see intel coming from a confidential witness, Peter Corso. Really makes you wonder. 66-year-old Peter Corso will be sentenced to 12 years to life in 1988 for another drug charge. He would also admit to the murder of Cervera, as well as two others. And finally, while we're on the subject of the DeMeo crew, there was this guy. The one and only Henry Borelli. Hitman, prolific car thief, and integral member of the DeMeo crew. Henry Borelli was the cousin of John Riccobono's common-law wife, Phyllis Latore Corso. Phyllis referred to Henry as her brother. In turn, John Riccobono would call him his brother-in-law. To me, this gives more credence to the Peter Corso DeMeo crew connection. John Roberts, a.k.a. John Riccobono, would refer to Henry as a fun guy to be around, but they didn't do much business together. He claimed that his wife Phyllis's sister, Fran, once got their cousin Henry Borelli to rob and kill her boyfriend after she developed a jealous fit of rage. Furthermore, John would say that after he broke up with Phyllis, Henry Borelli stalked him in Miami with plans to rob him. They would have a heated exchange when they met, which would result in one of John's guys shooting Henry's friend in the kneecap. After this, Henry apologized, and according to John, Henry executed his own friend as a show of friendship to John, telling him that he wanted John to be reassured that nothing would happen to him. Truly unbelievable stuff. John Purnell Roberts, a.k.a. John Riccobono, would pass away at the age of 66 in December of 2011. He would leave behind a tale so unbelievable, at times it's hard to believe. His criminal career will no doubt go down as one of the most interesting and prolific in the annals of American history. Before we go, I just want to say a couple of things. As I just previously mentioned, John Pernell Roberts' story is so unbelievable, it's almost hard to believe. I'm here presenting you a story based on things that John Pernell Roberts, a.k.a. John Riccobono, has said and maybe connect some pieces together to form a interesting narrative. It's not my job to prove John Purnell Roberts to be a liar, to be truthful. Like I said, I'm simply passing information that has come out of his mouth. 
There was other things in the book American Desperado, such as drugging uh, talk show host Ed Sullivan, partying with O.J. Simpson in Miami and doing massive amounts of cocaine with him. He also claimed that Jerry Chili, Banano Capo, was his uncle. So he says a lot of things in this book which makes you scratch your head at times. But nonetheless, an incredibly interesting read. And I hope that you guys got something out of this upload. And uh, if you think he's full of shit, well, you know, play it in the comments. Let's see what you guys think. Do you think he's being truthful about everything he's ever said? Much of his Miami uh, trafficking days is well documented. I don't think he... Uh, He's, um, you know, lying much about that, or there's not really any way to get around that. He spoke about it candidly in court documents, and I'm sure a lot of what he says can be backed up. His New York history is a bit shadowy, um, but listen, I'm just trying to connect the dots to some interesting people that were around his life in New York and bring you the story. If you think he's uh, a teller of tall tales, well, maybe he is. Let's hear it in the comments. You guys have a great beautiful week. If you want to contribute, donate to my channel. There's a cash app in my about section. I'll put it on the screen now. You could send a super thanks or you could like and leave a comment. That helps me too. Appreciate it. Everybody have a great one.